I'm happy to be here to share some thoughts about taking moonshots, and I hope that some of them will be helpful. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Astro Teller. I'm the captain of Moonshots at Alphabet, and I oversee the Moonshot factory here at Alphabet. So our job is to try lots of things. Most of them don't work out. And very occasionally out the other side of the process that we run, we produce something like Google Brain or uh, Waymo, the self-driving car project, uh, Verily, which is the life science business now for Alphabet, uh, Wing, which is the self-flying vehicles for package delivery for Alphabet, Loon, the stratospheric balloons for Alphabet, et cetera. And so I thought that I would share with you first my deep sense of gratitude that you're pushing the international community to take moonshots seriously. Uh, it's very near and dear to my heart, as you might imagine. And I think that the world needs moonshots more than ever. Moonshots at one level just means things that are big, that are hard, that are important. <clears throat> but particularly when I say moonshot, when we say moonshots here at X, what we mean are things that have three basic elements to them. Number one, in order for it to be a moonshot, at least here, there needs to be a huge problem in the world that we can name and that we want to get rid of. If you don't have that, it's not a moonshot. Number two, there has to be a radical proposed solution to solving that big problem. Sometimes we jokingly say it's a science fiction sounding product or service that however unlikely it is that we could make it, if we could make it, it would make this huge problem go away. And then third, there needs to be some breakthrough technology, which even if it's not guaranteed to work, gives us a chance of making that science fiction sounding product or ser service happen so that we can solve that huge problem in the world. Even when we have all three of those things, at least here at X, what we would say is that's not a finished moonshot. That is a moonshot story hypothesis. Then we can go test that hypothesis. But here's the scary bit that I most want to share with you. Most of our moonshots do not work out. And I think you need to prepare yourselves for most of your moonshots not to work out. It is almost the definition of a moonshot that if it would give in, if it could be solved through huge amounts of money and hard work, and intelligence, someone would probably already have done it. What makes it a moonshot is specifically that it's over the horizon. We can't see it, we can't understand it well, and it is counterintuitive in its solution. And be, by being counterintuitive in its solution, spending lots of money and telling lots of smart people to run towards it for long periods of time is actually an excellent way to waste lots of money. At least our experience has been that you need to try a lot of different things of these moonshot story hypotheses. And then as you learn about how each of them are going, the teams come together, the technology is being de-risked, how the technology would be used in the world is being de-risked. You can look at some of them, most of them, truth be told, and say, oh, that's too bad. That looked really exciting when we started this project. But now that we're a year in, two years in, we've learned a lot and it doesn't look like that's nearly as exciting as we thought. We've tried to pivot lots of different ways based on how we've learned over that first one, two, maybe three years. And there just aren't any great solutions here. Should we keep going for another decade, hoping that we're going to find some solution? 
Should we keep going for another decade because we'll look stupid if we say we couldn't do it? We could, but that would be an enormous waste of money. So what we do is we kill it. We say, great job for having tried this. We have learned and moonshot taking is all about learning. We have successfully discovered there is no great moonshot to be done here. And then we repurpose that money and those people on the moonshots that we've been trying in parallel with that, that are working out better. Now, this is a culture engineering problem. If you have a big pile of people here who are working on a moonshot to cure cancer, let's say, and a big pile of people over here who are working on a moonshot to try to uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it into the ground. It's very hard to tell the people over here, hey, don't worry, we're firing all of you, you've lost your jobs, but don't worry, those people over there, they still have a nice moonshot going. So you need enough of these moonshots where you can say to people, your moonshot's not working, but in exchange for you being intellectually honest and saying that your moonshot is not working, we can help some of you to get into this other moonshot, maybe here in the middle. So having multiple healthcare moonshots, multiple climate crisis moonshots, the more different ways that you are exploring the world, the more chances you have to credibly say to the people working on these projects that they're being intellectually honest and saying that the things they're trying aren't working out can be rewarded by helping them move into a different project, a different moonshot. I know how uncomfortable that is, even for other businesses. I know how extra uncomfortable that is for governments. I'm not trivializing what I'm asking for, but I'm, I'm giving you my experience that pre-deciding on a thing you want to solve when you don't know whether it's solvable at all, whether you have the right people, whether now is even a possible time to solve that problem, uh, it's really hard. I also can tell you our experience is that if you pre-promise a team, you have 10 years to solve this important problem, there'll be no sense of urgency for them. They will work slowly and uncreatively. If you say to a hundred teams, you each have one year, don't worry, you don't have to solve the problem inside this year. What you need to do in one year is help us understand your team, your technology, the problem you're trying to solve better. Help us see how yours is one of the projects we should double down on. And then of those hundred that you start with, in year two, you might give all of the resources you would have given to all hundred only to 30 or 40 of them and say, but you give more each to those 30 or 40 teams. And you say, now do it again for a year. And then after another year, maybe you winnow it down from 30 or 40 teams down to 20 teams. And the year after that, maybe to 10 teams. Each time you reduce the number of teams, you can increase the amount of resources that you give each team. This causes the teams to be much more focused, not on finishing the job in one year, but on what they can learn inside a year. And the reaction, particularly of technologists, again, in our experience at X, is technologists all wanna believe that they know how to solve problems. So their reaction the world over is, tell me what the problem is, let me think about it really hard for six months, maybe a year. I will design a perfect solution, then give me huge amounts of money, leave me alone for three to five years. I will build the perfect solution based on my perfect design, and then we'll be done. And 100% of the time, if you let them do that, they will have built you something of no value at the end. 
because moonshots are counterintuitive, because moonshots defy prediction about how to solve them. Again, if we could predict ahead of time how to solve the moonshots, someone would already have solved them. That's what makes it a moonshot, is that it has that required level of creativity and bravery and experimentation that you need to exercise in order to get there. And because of that, I think what is required is that you create pressure and incentives on teams so that they try things quickly, they iterate quickly, you create incentives for them to think creatively and to be weird in the proposals that they make. You create incentives for them to take bets on big risks as long as they're smart risks. So for example, here, here's um, a way of describing this that resonates with people at X. If I said, I'm gonna give you choice A or choice B. Choice A, you can give, um, you can solve a really important problem for a million people in the world, guaranteed. Or choice B, you can solve a, a problem for a hundred million people in the world, but it's only one chance in 10. So that's choice B, solve a problem for a million, 100 million people in the world, but one chance in 10. Or choice A, solve a problem for a million people in the world, guaranteed. Now, if you ask anyone in your organizations, hopefully they will all pass the, pass the math test. When you ask them, would you like choice A or choice B, they will all say, of course, I would like choice B, because choice B has an expected utility, which is 10 times choice A. But now ask them honestly, does your boss, your manager, the head of your part of the government, do they support you in any way, even a tiny bit, choosing choice B? Do us an anonymous survey of the people who report to you you will find that essentially no one believes that you want them to do choice B. But moonshots, by being 10x, by being over the horizon, by shooting for audacity, are explicitly trying to harvest things where the reward risk ratio is better, but the risk is high enough, people wouldn't normally do it. And so then the question is, how can you create positive incentives and negative incentives to prevent people from doing choice A and to encourage them to do choice B? Because all the people in almost every organization in the world who all say, well, Rihanna, we're just going to do choice A, they won't do choice B, not because they can't do the math, but because they think you'll fire them if they take a choice B bet, and then nine times in 10, it doesn't work out, they get a zero, they expect to be fired. They're thinking to themselves, what do I say to my husband or wife? My peers will laugh at me, I won't be promoted, I won't get a bonus, I might well get fired. Why would I take that kind of risk, even if the reward risk ratio is smart? So part of moonshot thinking isn't just telling them to do choice B, it requires creating an environment where they want to choose choice B, where they feel safe to choose choice B. And I think that that is going to be the challenge for this symposium and for moonshots that are set up, is thinking through the inherent risk aversion that people have and that governments have if you cannot have moonshots except through learning and learning only comes through failure and you can't tolerate failure then you just won't get moonshots that's the tension that i think you have to solve for yourself now at x we've solved that problem by telling everyone ahead of time we're going to fail a lot Money comes into X, you have to wait a very long period of time, 
and then out the other side, occasionally, you will get something like Waymo, our self-driving car company. But in order for us to do that, we're gonna have to try lots of things that don't work. We will end up with lots of egg on our face. And we want, badly enough, to create this huge upside value for the world and for Alphabet that we create through things like the drone delivery project Wing or Waymo or Loon or others, that we're willing to end up with that egg on our face in order to get that value. That's what moonshot taking means to us. And I think that setting that cultural tone, creating those incentives for your teams as you try to set up um, a moonshot thinking for moonshot taking, I think that's gonna be part of uh, the challenge that you experience. I would also say that if you want particularly creative teams, if you want particularly weird teams that make weird, the kind of weird proposals that often are terrible, they just don't work out, but very occasionally are brilliant, because that's what moonshots come from, is those occasional brilliant statements. And you cannot have brilliant without a lot of crazy coming along for the ride. You will only get that kind of perspective shifting, that kind of, huh, I would never have thought of that. What a beautiful idea you've just proposed, unless you have an incredible diversity of people in your organizations. I don't know any other way to stretch the thinking of a group except to stretch the envelope of their joint understanding of the world. That certainly includes gender diversity and race diversity, but it also includes other kinds of diversity. If you don't have very young people and very old people, you're missing an opportunity within your moonshot taking group. If you don't have people who come from other countries, who are veterans of foreign wars or other things that give them special experiences, you're missing various kinds of knowledge that they could transplant from their domain that they're experienced in to some weird, seemingly irrelevant domain. Because that's one of the sort of fundamental aspects of the kind of creativity that tends to drive moonshot thinking. I would also like to think that to the extent we want to drive ethical moonshots, changes in the world that don't just make money, but are really actually good for the world. And I know that you want the same thing. Having a lot of diverse voices at the table is also the best way to see early on if there are Achilles heels problems in what you're designing not just technical problems, but problems where it might be very good for one part of society if you solve the problem this way, but it might be bad for another part of society. Those kinds of opportunities or problem areas are easier to surface with a lot of understanding. And then as a final thinking about mantras that we use internally to help us with moonshot thinking, with moonshot taking that I think might help you. One of our mantras is get out in the world as fast as possible. Test your things as fast as possible. Not only is learning key, but I think that there tends to be a tendency because you don't want to discover early on that what you're working on isn't right people tend to hoard their work. They only test it in safe environments because they don't wanna look stupid. But if you help them believe that learning is what's most important, then you can help them see that getting out into the world, testing their technology, testing the product that comes from that technology, even testing businesses that come from that product or service, that doing those things is the only real way to learn and learning is the only real way to make a moonshot. I hope that was helpful and I wish you the best of luck in the moonshot thinking and moonshot taking that you're embarked on. Have a wonderful day.